This is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Narcotics Division. The boss is Captain Gindon. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Authorities estimate that half of the 13 billion doses of barbiturates and amphetamines produced annually in this country find their way into illegal channels and underwrite a $250 million a year black market traffic in drugs. The dangerous drugs recovered on our most recent arrest made a very small dent in that market but there was still enough to supply an average-sized high school for a full month. Package six of eight, 2,356 capsules resembling secondol. Package seven. 4,023 double-scored tablets resembling benzedrine. And yellow jackets, 927 caps. Resembling Nembutal, is that it? Right. If we keep snagging supplies like this, I'm putting in for a counting machine. I'll buy that. What do you say, Deemer? Fred, it's been a long time. You still work in the California Rehab Center? Yeah, and the caseloads you wouldn't believe. I know you guys are up to your ears, too, but I've got one here you handled before, Joe. Third name down, first page. Remember him? John Aldrich. He's the kid I found almost dead from an overdose in that shooting gallery on the east side. That must have been three or four years ago. Exactly three years ago. Aldrich was 16 then, he's 19 now. What was so special about him? Well, nothing really, Bill. Typical case. 16-year-old kid from a nice family and good home. He started smoking pot at 13, then pills, then a long run with speed, and by the time he was 16, he was strung out good on heroin. Finally, he got a hold of some hot stuff, and it nearly killed him. And now you're his parole agent. Right, and I need a favor. You name it, Fred. When Aldrich turned 18, his parents had him committed to the California Rehabilitation Center as a narcotic addict. He stayed for nine months and finally qualified for the outpatient program. He lived at home until about two weeks ago and was doing fine. I was put on the case just after he skipped. Have you been to the house? I just don't have the time, Bill. I've talked to his parents on the phone several times. They're concerned, but don't have any idea where to start looking for him. Two weeks. That's plenty of time to score again. That's why I want to get him back to the center fast before he gets too strung out. If he builds a habit, he's got to support it. Well, if he gets the funds to support it, I'll say one thing. What's that? He's not going to have a hard time finding it. <laughs> Thursday, March 7th, the Aldrich home was located in one of the better sections of Los Angeles. Shirley Aldrich, the mother of the missing addict, was concerned about the welfare of her son. It's been two weeks, Sergeant. He was doing so well. It was like, like a new life for us. Was there anything that happened, anything that would have made him want to leave? Oh, how can you say? There are so many things a mother doesn't see. I look. So help me God, I look. Yes, ma'am, we understand. Now, what about his outside activities? What's he been doing since he was paroled? He started college on a part-time basis, and he worked three hours a day at the gas station down at the corner. He seemed so happy. Mom, guess what? Billy, I'd like you to meet Sergeant Friday and Officer Gannon from the police department. How do you do, Sergeant Friday? I'm glad to meet you. Nice to know you, son. Officer Gannon, pleased to meet you. My pleasure, Billy. You had a game today, huh? I'll say we slaughtered them, 12 to nothing. Son, why don't you run into your room and climb out of those clothes, huh? OK, Dad. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Sergeant? Yes, sir, it has. Sergeant Friday is the one that found Johnny in that place over on Boyle Street three years ago, the time he almost died. I met him at the emergency hospital. Oh, yes. I talked to Fred Deemer on the phone yesterday. He said you might drop by. Yes, sir, it's really more in his line when there's a violation of parole, but if there's something we can do to help, we're willing to do what we can. I hope you can get further than I did. I've talked to everyone that even remotely knows Johnny, his girlfriend, his buddies. I even went back to that dump on Boyle Street thinking he might go back to some of his old haunts. Do you notice any signs that would indicate he might be using again? That's it, Officer Gannon. There was nothing. What about his friends? Have there been any new faces around? Anybody that might make you suspicious? No. Johnny gave up all his old friends when he was paroled from the center. He even said it wasn't a good idea to hang around with them again. Six months. That's how long he was home this time. 
I thought we were finally going to make it. Did he have his own bedroom, Mr. Aldrich? Why, yes, he did. Be all right if we take a look? Of course. It's right in here. I've checked around in there several times already. There didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary. Well, this is it. If you didn't know, it'd be hard to believe this room belonged to a narcotic addict. Mr. Aldrich, did Johnny keep a diary or did he have a personal telephone book? Well, yes, he did. I've checked through it already, though. It's right here. I recognized all the names. They're all good kids. He met them since he left the center. That's his girl, Nancy Harris. They've been going together on and off since high school. Nice looking girl. Yes, she is. And she's good for Johnny. They were planning to get married in a couple of years. What does she do, Mrs. Aldrich? College girl, top of her class. She used to help Johnny with his studies. Mr. Aldrich, I noticed this name here, Pete Randolph. He has a notation by it, CRC. Do you know anything about that? Well, yeah, Pete was Johnny's roommate at the rehabilitation center. Is Randolph still in? As far as I know, he is. He hasn't been around here. OK, I guess that does it. I'm going to have to get this drawer fixed. You mind if we take a look, Mr. Aldrich? No, go ahead. It's just jammed. I don't imagine you can fix it. A hype kit. Oh, no. Dear God, no. Is that Johnny's? I guess it is. Is he going to be sick again? I hope not, son. I hope not. Do you think you can find him, Sergeant? Well, I'm sure he'll turn up eventually, but what's more important is to locate him right away if we can. So he doesn't get strung out, you mean? Yeah, I can talk hype talk with the best of them. We've been through it enough. Since that day I met you in the hospital three years ago, Sergeant Friday, our life has been one great big merry-go-round. Hospital to sanitarium to jail and back again. I've seen my son climb the walls here in his bedroom, crawl around on the floor like an animal. I've seen him drink orange juice by the quart just to get that monkey off his back a little. He begged me on his knees for $20 just to get that one fix, that one lousy fix. Walt, don't, please. It's not a pretty story, Sergeant. We've done what we can for the boy. We'll keep doing everything and anything we can. But it's just that I've run out of ideas. I don't know what else to do. I went wrong somewhere, and so help me, I don't know where. You see, we haven't given our sons the everything you hear that so many parents give and then wonder what went wrong. We've tried to teach them responsibility, feelings for other people, and we've always had an active interest in them. We've done things together, and we've had family projects. We talked about anything and everything. We didn't have any generation gap in our home. Somewhere along the line, someone got to our son. Something was said, something was done. He fell for it. Our problem was we didn't know one single thing about the drug problem. Maybe if we had, we would have recognized it in time. But you know, I think back on it now, what was being said about drugs when Johnny first started. There were no warnings, no responsible people telling it like it is. There was controversy, arguments justifying pot and pills, all that junk. Times haven't changed very much, have they? Monday, March 11th, we started the day by checking with Fred Deemer on the current status of John Aldrich's roommate, Peter Randolph. Is Randolph still in the center? No. Fred says he was put on the outpatient program about four months ago. Was Randolph had contact with the Aldrich boy? Well, Fred wasn't sure. Randolph is supposed to check in with Fred every Wednesday as part of his condition of parole. Yeah. He's five days late. Fred checked his apartment house out. No sign of him. I got his last good address. Narcotics Friday. Who? Yes, ma'am. Well, yes, that's right. I see. Yes, well, we'll bring a picture along. Yes, we'll meet you there. Thank you very much. That was John Aldrich's girlfriend, Nancy Harris. She talked with John's parents last night. They told her we were interested in finding Peter Randolph. Yeah, what do you got? Nancy says a guy named Pete was on campus two days before John disappeared. 8.40 a.m., after obtaining a mugshot of Peter Randolph from R&I, we drove to the college campus. 
Nancy Harris had agreed to meet us in the campus coffee shop. I'm sorry you had to come all the way out here, but I have a 9 o'clock class and I just can't afford to miss. We understand, Miss Harris. Now, we'd like to talk to you about this man you said was looking for John Aldridge. Well, he wasn't exactly looking for him. He and Johnny apparently had arranged to meet here. Johnny introduced me, but he used only his first name, Pete. I see. Now, is this the man? Why, yes. Who is he? His name's Peter Randolph. He was John's roommate at the rehabilitation center. Is he in some kind of trouble, too? We don't know yet, miss. When they met here, what did they have to say? Do you remember? Nothing, really. They seemed kind of reluctant to talk in front of me. How's that? Oh, you know, just a bunch of small talk, the weather, classes Johnny was taking, things like that. Did they mention narcotics at all? No, like I said, just a lot of small talk. I was only with him about five minutes. I had a class. Now, there is one thing. Yes? Well, it could be my imagination. But when I was walking out, they looked like they got real serious. Pete reached over the table and grabbed Johnny by the arm. Then they started talking real softly, but fast, you know? Could you hear anything they said? No, by that time, I was all the way over by the door. I didn't really think any more about it until now. Can you think of anything that would have triggered Johnny to take off or start using narcotics again? Nothing I can really put my finger on. But Johnny did seem nervous about a week or so before he left. He was kind of worried about letting his folks down and all. How do you mean that? Oh, you know, his grades. We had this sociology class with Professor Thurston, and Johnny wasn't doing so well. Did I hear someone mention my name? Oh, Professor Thurston, I didn't see you standing there. Just walking by, Nancy. Always interested in the predicate when I'm part of the subject. We were just talking about Johnny. Oh, Professor, I'd like you to meet Sergeant Friday and Officer Gann in LAPD. Well, what brings the local police to our institution of higher learning? They're trying to locate Johnny. Aldrich? Yes, sir. He's been missing about two weeks now. Miss Harris was mentioning something about his grades. Well, as I was saying, he wasn't doing very well in Professor Thurston's class, and he was worried about what his parents would say. That's right. His last examination was terrible. He started off the semester ahead of his class, but then he began to drop quite rapidly. Johnny thought he knew more about the subject matter than Professor Thurston, and he wouldn't give up. What was the subject matter? You two might possibly find it enlightening. It was a lecture series of mine on the hoax surrounding the use of marijuana and drugs in our society. In what way did John argue with you? Well, first of all, I'm an expert on the subject. I've done countless hours of research, and I've come to various conclusions that this myth about pot and pills is overrated and dealt with in an unrealistic way. Just one example. John argued violently when I pointed out that marijuana had absolutely nothing to do with developing desire for hard narcotics like heroin. As I said, the boy just didn't have an open academic mind. Did he have a chance to present his side of the story? There was no reason to. I'm the expert, and it was my class. Well, now, maybe your studies didn't convince him. Well, they should have. I have statistical proof to back everything I teach. Professor, did you ever think about the fact that there are a lot of human elements in this world that just can't be measured statistically? Oh, yes, here we go again. The typical cop has to stick up for those antique laws and archaic methods of dealing with modern social problems. No, sir. It's just that we see all those rotten things that tear people apart that are never dealt with in your academic studies. And the sad part of it is, an individual of your intelligence and background has such a great influence on a young mind that hasn't experienced the real world seems to me that Johnny's case was different. He'd had a taste of that real world, and he called you on it. Sounds to me like you're assailing the academic community's influence on society, right? No, sir, I'm not. It has its place, and it makes its contribution. It's an enormous contribution if it's done with responsibility and real insight into the problem. Permit me to offer you a piece of truth, Sergeant. My training and sophistication in the field of social research gives me much more insight than any policeman could ever have. Professor, let me ask you something. What's that? What did you do after graduating from high school? I attended the university and obtained my degree. Then what? I continued my studies, completed the master's program, and went on for my PhD. And what kind of work did you do while you were going through school? My, we have a regular interrogation going on here, haven't we? Up until I took my master's, I devoted all my time to study and research. I then became a teaching assistant in the sociology department. And after you obtained your PhD? I remained as an associate until I gained full professorship. I ask you, Sergeant, what is your point? The point is, Professor, that you've spent your entire life in an academic environment surrounded with research, studies, and intellectual discussions on the ills of society. Walk outside the classroom and take a look at what really goes on before you publish your next study, will you? Take a look at the world of an addict like John Aldrich before you rule on antique laws and archaic methods. Give it that much, Professor. 
For your edification, Sergeant, I've seen a lot more than you may think I have. It's not all as dreary as you make it out to be with your rash generalizations. Oh, I've seen it too, Professor. So often my stomach turns every time I think of it. All the things you can't put in a test tube or analyze in a computer. Rich kids, middle class kids, and poor kids. All attaching themselves to something they can't find any other way except by blowing grass or dropping a pill or mainlining heroin. Now, if they get the chance, they grow up. Maybe. But what do they become? Vegetables, welfare cases, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers that don't have the maturity or emotional balance to handle their own lives, much less influence others. They live in their own little world of rosy red paths and cloudy dreams. And when the dreams are over, what's left? They're sick, they're psycho, they're broken, or they're dead. Yeah, they build a nice future for themselves, don't they? A future built on a foundation of weed, needles, and psychedelic logic. That's a rich future, Professor, isn't it? We've given these young minds a lot to build on, haven't we? The intellectuals justify it and the hoodlums reap the harvest. Think about it, Professor Thurston. The next time you make a study, dig a little deeper and a little harder. Think about your role, my role, and why we're here. You know, when we're no longer here, there's only one measure, and it's not gonna come from a computer printout or an intellectual's dissertation. And what would that measure be, Sergeant? The kind of contribution we've left behind us, Professor. Don't you let it worry you, Sergeant. I know what I'll leave behind. Next time you see him, you tell that to John Aldrich, will you? Nine fifty-eight a.m. On our way back in, we got a message to call the office. Fred Deemer had been trying to reach us. We called Fred. He told us that Peter Randolph had just checked in with him. Deemer told Randolph to wait at his apartment for us. 10 a.m., we drove over to Peter Randolph's apartment house. Peter Randolph? Yes? Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Oh, yeah, I've been expecting you. Come on in. I just talked to my P.O., Mr. Deemer. He said you'd be dropping around. I've been out of town with one of the trucks. I had a chance to pick up some O.T. I forgot to call Deemer. Where do you work, Pete? Down at Ship's Trucking on Alameda. I swamped for one of the drivers. How long have you been there? Ever since I got out of the center. It's been about four months now. They arranged the job and everything for me when I got out. Mr. Casey, well, that's my boss, thinks I'm doing real good. Said if I kept it up, he'd give me a promotion. You gonna be a driver? No, can't get a license. You know, being an ex-addict and all. He's gonna put me inside on dispatching. There's a good future in that, you know? Yeah? You having any problems cutting it? You mean staying away from junk? Yeah, it's tough, all right, but I've got my mind made up. I'm gonna make it. Hey, wait a minute. You think I have something to do with Johnny going back on smack? Is he? Look, you know I'm not supposed to associate with other addicts. They might violate oh, me. Now, come on, Pete. When did you see him last? Okay, it was a few weeks ago. Where? Out at the college where he goes to school. And that was the last time? I looked him up to warn him off. I was trying to help him. Make it a little plainer, Pete. Well, a few weeks ago, I was unloading the truck downtown, down on East 5th. And I saw Johnny talking to Jennings. Robert Jennings. Yeah. Grapevine has a Jennings is dealing again. Recruiting pushers, you know. All right, go ahead. Well, that's all. I saw him talking. They didn't see me. But I got to thinking about Johnny turning on again. I didn't want to see it happen, so I looked him up at the college a couple days later. I tried to warn him off Jennings. And? Johnny was already fouled up. He'd been chipping for about a week or so by then. Did he say so? Didn't have to. I saw the marks. Did he say where Jennings was holding up? I didn't ask. But you can bet it's somewhere on East 5th. I hear Jennings is dealing strong downtown. All right, Pete. Anything else? Oh, that's it. Honest. I haven't seen him since. Have you tried? No, sir. That day at the college was it for me. No more. What makes you say that? Johnny. He tried to turn me on. We returned to the office and arranged to meet with Officer Tim Miles. Officer Miles had worked the footbeat on East 5th Street for the past 12 years, 2.45 p.m. So if there's anyone who can locate Jennings down there, it's you, Tim. I saw him a couple of weeks ago, but not since. I thought he left the street. Do you hear any rumbles about him, Tim? Well, the word was he was dealing again. I thought I had him dirty that last time. How's that? Some say he was dealing out of a fake lining in his jacket. And? I saw him inside the restroom in one of the theaters on Main. There were a couple of hypes hanging around. I knew he was holding just by the smell of it. And you couldn't take him? That's right. My information wasn't from anyone the courts would call a reliable informant. So, not having enough probable cause for arrest, any search would have been thrown out of court. You work narco, I don't have to tell you. Did you talk to Jennings? Yeah, I told him to stay off of my beat. Not that I could have backed it up. Here's a mug on the boy we're looking for, Tim. Haven't seen him before, but if he's down there, he'll turn up sooner or later. Give it what you can, Tim. We'd sure appreciate it. Right, I'll pass the word and put the whole street to work on it. What's your interest in this, Aldridge? You a big dealer? No, just a young kid with a nice family headed for a lousy future. 
An old story with a new face. Tuesday, March 12th, 5 p.m. There was still no word on John Aldridge. Wednesday, March 13th, Bill and I continued with our routine caseload and also made frequent visits to the downtown area in search of the missing addict, John Aldridge. Thursday, March 14th, eight days had passed. 3.20 p.m., we got a break. Aldrich? Right. Tim Miles found him in a flop house down on East 5th Street. Alone? No, we had a friend with him, Robert Jennings. 3.40 p.m., we arrived at a cheap hotel on Lower East 5th Street. Officer Tim Miles had the narcotics dealer, Robert Jennings, in custody. Joe, Bill, Jennings here finally fell. Got him holding two ounces. The Aldrich boy's inside. We saw the ambulance in front. What's gone down? I called him. The desk clerk hailed me off the street, said somebody was crying for help up here. I came up. The door was open. Jennings here was trying to stuff the Aldrich kid under the bed. He either popped too much or Jennings here gave him a hot shot. Pretty bad, isn't he? I haven't seen worse. At 10 p.m., John Aldrich was removed to Central Receiving Hospital. His parents met us there. How is he, Sergeant? We don't know, Mr. Aldrich. He's in shock. They're treating him now. What happened? Where'd you find him? In a hotel room downtown. He'd taken an overdose of heroin. Oh, no. Oh, Johnny. Johnny. It's like three years ago all over again, Sergeant. Dead. Johnny's dead. Yes, sir, we're sorry. I guess there's nothing more to say, is there? <laughs> Friday, Gannon, Don Jones, City Press. I'm on that narcotics arrest they called into the newsroom. What do you got? A 19-year-old boy named John Aldrich just died, overdose of heroin. Kind of a short story, isn't it? No, Don, it's a long story. It started six years ago in a poppy field in Turkey, a marijuana patch in Mexico, and a pill factory here in the States, and parents who just didn't know how to spot the signs in time. What kind of signs, Joe? The odor of burnt rope in their son's clothing, cigarette paper in his pocket, the wearing of dark glasses, sleeplessness, sweating, slurred speech, erratic emotions, visits by strange friends, telephone calls at odd hours. No, the story's a long and tragic one that represents a real challenge to all of us. The heroin that found its way into that young American's veins came across the oceans to this country through the efforts of money-hungry organized men. A slight risk to them with an immense profit. This country of ours does have a challenge, Don. A challenge? Yes, a challenge to stem the tide of dangerous drugs and narcotics and to educate our youth. Give the kind of education that'll teach a youngster to cope with life without the need for drugs. What age do you begin this education? At birth. It might make life a little happier and a damn sight longer. just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 3rd, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The court found the suspect guilty of Section 11505 of the Health and Safety Code possession of heroin for sale, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state prison for not less than five nor more than 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> 